If you usually listen to me on Spotify and you've not been getting my latest episodes, click the Spotify link in the description so you can follow the updated podcast feed. Welcome friends to another r slash malicious compliance video. Today we've got a lot of awesome stories and our first story of the day is from Julian Morrow. You ordered it, you deal with it. A calculating malicious compliance happened years ago to a colleague. He needed soil for his garden and had calculated that he needed 24 cubic meters, about 850 cubic feet. This was a regular terraced house, not a park or anything. My guess is that he had some 50 square meters of garden and somehow wanted the soil to be 50 centimeters deep. Of course, the company flat out refused to sell it to him, explaining over and over that it was way too much. He didn't listen, and eventually they settled on 12 cubic meters, plus the promise that he could order more if needed. One fateful day, the truck arrived and my colleague finally realized how much 12 cubic meters actually is. He tried in vain to stop the delivery guy, and spent days with friends with wheelbarrows trying to get somehow rid of everything. It took quite a while before he could laugh about it. I'm not going to lie and pretend that I would be any better as far as measuring with volume. 100% my weakest class in school was always math. And when you get into cubic and square feet, cubic and square meters, not going to lie, you've already lost me. Are you guys any better than I am when it comes to cubic and square meters and feet? Because honestly, I would be panicking if I had to try to calculate how many cubic meters or feet my yard is. Let me know how you guys would do in the comments down below. Our next story is from his Vera Farah. Have fun working five jobs, DM. So I work at a small store. My manager quit. The assistant manager got fired for stealing money. Two other employees quit because of the new workload. And now I'm stuck doing all of it. So I told my district manager, I'll expect a temporary increase to $29 an hour plus overtime to account for the extra work outside my job description. The amount isn't random, it's the sum of mine and my manager's wages. Expect me to do the work of five people? Pay me. He says no and that I'm not expected to do any more than my agreed upon job description. His exact words were, just keep doing your job. Nobody's expecting you to do the other jobs as well. So I do just that. I don't do the deposits, the security briefings, the sales reports, the containment inspections, etc all tasks that are outside my job description. So my district manager gets mad saying none of the work is done. I say, you told me you were not going to approve my temporary wage increases because you were not expanding my job tasks. Therefore, I only did my job. He threw a fit about me obviously misunderstanding him and I stopped and told him, I didn't misunderstand you. I told you I would not do extra work without extra compensation. I should also mention that I went from working 15 hours a week to 75. He called me lazy and greedy because I just want to make a buck. Um, yes, that is indeed how this whole employment thing works. You need job done. I agree to do job for payment. You pay me to do job. So I quit. Have fun working the entire store by yourself without overtime because you're an exempt employee district manager. Well, I'll tell you one thing, it's pretty easy to see why they lost so many people. I mean, besides the fact that they also had just some awful people also working for them. They're definitely not going out of their way to try to retain anybody. You're so lazy and greedy for not bending over backwards for minimum pay for me. How dare you? This next story is from Mr. Sean Taylor, 1980. What do you want in your coffee? Not my story, but it happened to a friend of mine. Like many Canadians, he worked in a famous coffee chain named after a hockey player. These restaurants can get very busy during the peak times of the day, so patients can run a tad thin in the workers. My friend lived in a small town with a high retiree population, so this coffee house gave a senior's discount and the seniors knew about it. It was common that they would request their discount along with their order to ensure they would get their discount. One day, a senior woman came in during the afternoon rush and my friend greeted her as he normally did. How may I help you? The old lady says, I want a small coffee and my senior's discount. Friend pouring the coffee into the cup says, okay, what would you like in your coffee? She says, I want my senior's discount. They say, yes ma'am, I'll give you your discount. How do you take your coffee? The old lady getting more demanding says, I want my senior's discount. 
friend getting exasperated says, Ma'am, I understand. I will give you your discount, but I first need to make your coffee. What do you want in your coffee? She says, My senior's discount. My friend had reached his end. The senior's discount on a small coffee worked out to be around 10 cents. So he reached into the cash till, picked out a shiny new dime, dropped it in the coffee, put the lid on, handed it to the old lady and said, Okay, ma'am, one small coffee with the senior's discount. He immediately went for a break and never came back. Honestly, I mean, it doesn't excuse getting so angry and worked up, but I wonder if they were like hard of hearing or just something was in the way that really made them misunderstand the situation. Because I think we can all agree that even for an old lady, this seems like a very nonsensical reaction. Unless they literally interpreted, how do you take your coffee? As like asking, how do you want to pay for it or something? Which I feel like is a stretch. Our next story is from Swags Bags. But the cheese cup. My husband's old job was extremely picky about expenses. Several people from his office were sent to a half-day conference on the other side of the state. So with travel time, they were allowed to claim reimbursement for lunch. They stopped at Arby's, I think he said? And he got a couple of things off the dollar menu. Fries, a sandwich, drink, that kind of thing. And then to dip the fries, he got a 25 cent cup of cheese dip. I'm sure it was plasticky and mediocre as heck, but I try not to judge the man for his taste. Anyway, he got back and filed his reimbursement for like $4. Several days later, he was called into accounting to explain why he thought this cheese cup was a warranted expense as it was not part of his meal. Apparently, the unofficial policy was that you could reimburse a meal deal, but no extras. After a short argument, he convinced them to approve the 25 cents, but he was politely asked not to pull that again. So naturally, on any subsequent occasions they were out over mealtimes, he made a point to get whatever supersized combo extravaganza was on offer, costing two to three times what he would normally order. And accounting was like, yep, that's the correct way to do food. It's been years and my husband still gets mad when I casually drop the cheese cup incident in a conversation. I think he has a right to be mad, darn it. That is the kind of thing where you bring up and you bring back every single moment where OP just feels so justified and willing to go at bat for that 25 cent cheese cup. It's one of those situations where you're like, remember the cheese cup? And their reaction has to be something like, yes, it's unbelievable that they would try to shortchange me for a 25 cent of cheese dip. To this day, I'll die on that hill. The discussion they had over the 25 cent cup of cheese dip cost more than the 25 cent cup of cheese dip. This company easily lost money in paid wages and time because they had this discussion. Our next story is from Mixed Loveline, Alcohol Free Alcohol. This is a short one. Back in the 90s, I was in a club with my social circle. Now, I'm a complete lightweight when it comes to drinking, so I was often the designated driver in our group. That is, the guy who would not be drinking that night so he could drive everyone else home. On this particular night, it was $1 pots and spirits. A pot being a small beer, and spirits meaning cheap, watered-down spirits with a mixer, i.e. bourbon and coke. As I wasn't drinking alcohol that night, I walked up to the bar and asked for a coke with ice. Bartender says $3. I say, but it's dollar pots and spirits tonight. And she said, no, that's only pots and spirits. I then pointed out that I was a designated driver, and surely she understood that the post-mix coke was cheaper to pour anyway. Nope, wouldn't budge. I then asked for a bourbon and coke with no bourbon. She says no worries, pours me my drink, and charges me a dollar. I stared at her and she legitimately didn't seem to notice anything wrong with the interaction. Honestly, considering OP was the designated driver, I'm surprised to see the bartender give them a hard time. From what I've often heard, if you go up to the bartender and you mention that you're the designated driver, I've heard a lot of places will try to honestly work with you, some places will even give you free drinks. Just imagine being stuck up that you're trying to get a deal for a non-alcoholic drink. Our next story is from Voodoo285, can't talk to him, he's dead, ex's dad passed, he was a good guy, all about family and making sure they were comfortable. There were a few of these things, but the one for Dyson Care stands out. Small direct debit to cover the vacuum cleaner, wanted to cancel it after he passed. The agent says, we can't cancel the account without speaking to the account holder. X says, you can't, he's dead. 
The agent says, we can't cancel the account without speaking to the account holder. X says, you can't. He's dead. Do you want a copy of the death certificate? Agent says, we can receive that here. And I can't close the account without speaking to the account holder. Hang up. Cancel direct debits specifically before the account is closed by the bank so they get notified. They write a letter to him complaining he owes them money and will have to pay extra to continue his cover. He can't. He's dead. Well, I guess you can say there's one thing that Dyson confirmed. Dyson sucks. Our next story is from here at random. Give him the price he wanted. I used to work in a jewelry store, one of the large chains that's slowly dying due to us dastardly millennials not buying expensive shiny rocks. Every year, there was a tax-free weekend sale. Sales tax was 8.25% at the time, and my manager would just offer an even 10% off since it was a little more off for the customer, and for the sales rep, the 10% discount was its own easy-to-click button in our point of sale instead of manually putting in 8.25% every time. Win-win for everyone. Until Mr. Tax Free walks. Everything is going smoothly. He picks out a nice ring, and we go up to ring him up. He asks about us taking off the tax to save him some money. We tell him we're doing 10% off instead of tax-free. He begins to angrily demand his tax-free discount. My manager quickly was like, give the man what he wants. So instead of taking 10% off his purchase, we take 8.25% off. He walked out very satisfied with himself and never returned. I don't know if he ever realized 8.25 is less than 10. I'm willing to bet that this guy didn't even honestly know what the sales tax was, just that it exists. Like going back to when I was just a small kid, I used to take things up to the register at stores and ask them how much it would be after tax because I wasn't able to calculate it in my little child brain. I'm willing to bet this guy just didn't even know that sales tax was 8.25% and just thought they were getting ripped off. This next story is from Rainbows and Burgers. Well, they didn't say I had to assign them seats. In short, my wedding got hijacked. Ex-in-laws made me and ex pay for a wedding, filled it with 200 of their guests, and left us with 30 places for my family and our friends to share. Well, they said I had to invite their guests. They didn't say how or what I had to do at the wedding. So 200 people got slips of paper with the venue, time, and date printed on them. I left it to the ex-in-laws to explain what they were invited to. Then, I simply didn't do a seating chart for the in-laws' guests and didn't have a wedding party, so they couldn't ask anyone for help. So, amusingly, they all turned up. It was pure chaos. 200 boomers all milling around like headless chickens. Mom was absolutely livid with me because she says in-laws are her people. They're the same race. And how could I treat her people this way? The legal ceremony had been done earlier at home. So that took one element of potential chaos out. I simply shrugged and said nothing. Left ex-in-laws to sort their guests out. I think my paternal grandfather was laughing. I can't be sure. And to top it all off, my chaotic brother and his then-girlfriend decided to get the laptop and replace the wedding music with Highway to Hell and did a disappearing act. Honestly, given that the stupid venue manager refused to let me cancel the wedding because she wanted to help the ex, my mom took the ex's side. My dad got accused of being racist for suggesting gently that perhaps the in-laws could be less heavy-handed in this matter, and I think the in-laws try to take me hostage during the wedding prep. I can't find it in me to be sorry for any of that. Spoiler alert, I left that mess as soon as I legally could. The financial loss was ouch, but it was less than if I had outright left, and I was in a much better position when I left than I was while all that crap was going down. I mean, regardless of it all relatively working out for OP, I mean, I can't help but feel bad for them for having wasted their money on, honestly, what is such a nightmare and crap show. And our final story of the day is from Emperor Buttman. Petty airport security overdoes it. My BFF and I travel on a budget, and the nameless budget airline in question has a strict one bag, one personal item per person policy when you don't check a suitcase. We're on the return flight, and before they even let us through to the x-ray machines, we have a security in our face telling us that we're violating policy. We each have one bag and only one of us has a personal item, a tote bag that we had on our flight there with the same airline. Man's clearly got a problem, and when I cite the actual policy, he insists it's a baggage item. 
So I do what any normal person would do, don the bathrobe and cat-themed neck pillow, only items in the bag, fold up the tote, and stick it in one of our bags. Man still clearly needs his power trip, so now he sends us to another colleague to measure our bags. They fit the measurements perfectly, and as soon as we walk through his gate and hit real security, I take off the neck pillow and bathrobe and stick them back in the bag. Was satisfying to see the guy bite his tongue from the other side. You gotta love the modern airport security theater. Not only is it there to pretend to make you feel safer, but they're also there to give you a harder time as well. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. If you want to hear another compliance story that was way crazier than any of the ones in this video, click on that left video. Or if you missed my latest video, check out the one on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.